This is podcast number four in a Bible study on the book of Genesis. Today we will look at Genesis chapter 2. I begin by reading the chapter, and then we will go back and look at some of the highlights. We will begin with verse 4, since the first three verses were covered in the previous podcast. Genesis chapter 2, starting at verse 4. Quote, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. In the day that the Lord God made the earth and the heavens, when no plant of the field was yet in the earth, and no herb of the field had yet sprung up, for the Lord God had not caused it to rain upon the earth, and there was no man to till the ground. But a mist went up from the earth and watered the whole face of the ground. Then the Lord God formed man of dust from the ground, and breathed into his nostrils the breath of life, and man became a living soul. And the Lord God planted a garden in Eden in the east, and there he put the man whom he had formed. And out of the ground the Lord God made to grow every tree that is pleasant to the sight and good for food, the tree of life also in the midst of the garden, and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. A river flowed out of Eden to water the garden, and there it divided and became four rivers. The name of the first is Pishon. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Havilah, where there is gold, and the gold of that land is good. Bedellium and onyx stone are there. The name of the second river is Gihon. It is the one which flows around the whole land of Cush. And the name of the third river is Tigris, which flows east of Assyria. And the fourth river is the Euphrates. The Lord God took the man and put him in the garden of Eden to till it and keep it. And the Lord commanded the man, saying, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for on the day that you eat of it you shall die. Then the Lord God said, It is not good that the man should be alone. I will make him a helper fit for him. So out of the ground the Lord God formed every beast of the field and every bird of the air, and brought them to the man to see what he would call them. And whatever the man called every living creature, that was its name. The man gave names to all cattle, and to the birds of the air, and to every beast of the field. But for the man there was not found a helper fit for him. So the Lord God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man. And while he slept, took one of his ribs and closed up its place with flesh. And the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Then the man said, This at last is bone of my bones, and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother, and clings to his wife, and they become one flesh. And the man and his wife were both naked, and were not ashamed. End of quote. As stated in the introduction, there are two creation accounts in Genesis that differ in scope and purpose. The first account, in chapter 1, takes a grand sweep of cosmic proportions to focus on God's sovereignty and majesty in freely speaking creation into being from nothing. Thus, Elohim is used in chapter 1 as the name means Supreme One or Mighty One. In chapter 2, the focus narrows to consider the creation of the first human couple, and more intimately describes man's purpose and relationship with the Creator, here named not only as Elohim, but more personally as Lord or Yahweh. This is the name revealed by God from the burning bush to Moses, and is the covenant name associated with relationship, especially in terms of God's steadfast love and mercy. In the book of Exodus, chapter 34, for example, we have this startling reminder to Israel after its devastating fall at the golden calf apostasy that God is still in relationship with his people. Quote, The Lord passed before Moses and proclaimed, The Lord, the Lord, a God merciful and gracious, slow to anger and abounding in mercy and faithfulness, keeping merciful love for thousands, forgiving iniquity and transgression and sin. End of quote. Exodus chapter 34, verses 6 to 7. It is the name that Jesus Christ will repeatedly identify himself as, especially in the Gospel of John, 
with such statements as, quote, Before Abraham was, I am. End of quote. John chapter 8, verse 58. Having already considered the first three verses of chapter 2 in the last podcast, we begin with verse 4. Quote, These are the generations of the heavens and the earth when they were created. End of quote. As mentioned in podcast 1, this phrase, these are the generations, introduce a new section of the story, now specifying not just time at large from the seven days of creation, but human history in the specifics of place, that is, the Garden of Eden, and circumstances, that is, the first commandment and the first marriage. Whereas chapter 1 describes man being created in God's image and likeness, chapter 2, verse 7, is even more intimate, as the Lord God forms man of the dust from the ground and breathes into his nostrils the breath of life, and man becomes a living soul. The word formed has the sense of a potter involved in carefully fashioning a vessel of clay, as Job chapter 10 verse 9 indicates, quote, Remember that you molded me like clay. Will you now turn me to dust again? End of quote. The dust of the ground reminds us that the same material elements of creation that God brought into being in Genesis chapter 1 are used to form man so that, as St. Thomas Aquinas said in his Summa Theologica, quote, Man is called a little world because all creatures of the world are in a way to be found in him. End of quote. As well, being from the same clay, all are equal in terms of nature. There is no hierarchy of value or distinction based on class, race, wealth, or status. We are all one humanity in terms of our origin in birth and our return to the dust of death. This intimacy and unity extends to what distinguishes us from the lower animals, that is, the breath of life is breathed into us by God himself. This constitutes our soul, and while animals also have souls, the human soul is blessed with intellect and will by which we can enter into relationship with God at the intimate level of knowing and loving. As the Catechism states in paragraph 363, quote, In sacred scripture, the term soul often refers to human life or the entire human person but soul also refers to the innermost aspect of man, that which is of greatest value in him, that by which he is most especially in God's image. Soul signifies the spiritual principle in man. End of quote. With the breath of life from God, man, before the fall, is filled with sanctifying grace and walks in friendship with his Creator. Since the soul animates our human body, it too shares in the dignity of the image of God such that we are a body-soul composite, which, although separated in death, will be reunited at the general judgment by God's special gift. Yet already on this earth, our body with the soul can share in the dignity of becoming a temple of the Holy Spirit and a member of the body of Christ. This begins when the Son of God breathes the Holy Spirit on the Apostles, anticipating Pentecost and the birth of the Church. Beyond our first parents being blessed with intellect and will, the Catechism summarizing Catholic doctrine states that Adam and Eve were constituted in a state of original holiness and justice by God's grace to share in divine life. Paragraph 376 states, quote, by the radiance of this grace, all dimensions of man's life were confirmed. As long as he remained in the divine intimacy, man would not have to suffer or die. The inner harmony of the human person, the harmony between man and woman, and finally the harmony between the first couple and all creation, comprised the state called original justice. End of quote. Thus, the triple concupiscence of the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life would only be unleashed after the original sin. Before that event, man possessed self-mastery over his inner life such that the passions were compliant to the well-ordering of intellect and will. Blessed with the preternatural gifts of immortality, impassibility, that is, freedom from suffering, the gift of infused wisdom, 
and freedom from disordered desires, man, in verse 8, was placed in the Garden of Eden. This paradise, immersed in God's caring love, contained every tree that was pleasant to the sight and good for food, and a river to water the garden. Of special attention is the tree of life in the midst of the garden and the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. The river and the tree of life will appear again at the end of the Bible when creation is perfected in the new Jerusalem. See the book of Revelation chapter 22 verse 1 and 2. In between the first creation and its perfection, these two important realities are implied elsewhere in Scripture. For example, the river in Genesis chapter 2 can be seen in Ezekiel's vision of water flowing out from the threshold of the Jerusalem temple toward the east and giving life to the trees on either bank, and everywhere it flows, even into the Dead Sea. And in John chapter 4, where Jesus explains to the woman at the well about rivers of living water springing up to eternal life, symbolizing the Holy Spirit. And finally, the water which flowed from the side of Jesus as he hung upon the cross, as his heart was opened by the soldier's spear. The tree of life is a type of the cross, where Jesus is the fruit that provides eternal life to those who partake. Notice that the man in Genesis chapter 2 verse 15 is given the task of tilling and keeping the garden. As many scholars have pointed out, these are liturgical terms that one finds in the book of Numbers describing the duties of the priests serving in the tabernacle. Therefore, it appears that the Garden of Eden is portrayed as sacred space and that Adam has a priestly role in caring for that space. We saw the same perspective in the Genesis chapter 1 seven-day creation account of the cosmos and how that paralleled the construction of the tabernacle in Exodus chapters 25 to 27 and chapter 40. Not only is the Garden of Eden a sacred space, but actually can be compared to the state of grace, since God walked with man therein and blessed him with original justice and holiness. This is what Adam was to protect, and it is no different for us today. We, after being gifted in baptism with the Holy Spirit and infused theological and moral virtues, are in a state of grace. Our soul is therefore a sacred space, and we, in our baptismal priesthood, are called to protect it, care for it, and keep it, so that we bear the spiritual fruits. Just as the Garden of Eden had two trees, one giving life and the other death, the two ways, so often stated in sacred scripture, are presented to us. Each day in our ministry of priest, prophet, and king, we till the garden of our souls by exercising dominion, ruling over our passions, choosing the good and avoiding evil, proclaiming the good news, and offering spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God. In the state of grace, we have the great permission to love with abandon, to eat from the tree of life through the sacraments, and bear fruit in innumerable ways. Our only restriction is to stay clear of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil, this prohibition has nothing to do with gaining wisdom and knowledge, which we are free to taste, but rather take upon ourselves the prerogative of determining what constitutes good and evil apart from God, that is, shaping the natures of things, to call what is good evil and what is evil good. As we will see in Genesis chapter 3, this is at the heart of Satan's temptation of our first parents. In Genesis chapter 2, verse 16 to 17, God states, quote, You may freely eat of every tree of the garden, but of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil you shall not eat, for in the day that you eat of it you shall die. End of quote. The great permission is restricted only by a single command against a single tree, but the consequences of disobedience are clearly laid out. Why the prohibition? because without freedom to choose, there is no love. In verse 18, we find the first negative statement about creation, quote, It is not good that the man should be alone, end of quote. Here, as St. Pope John Paul II stated in his Theology of the Body, we have the, quote, 
original solitude. Since man was created in God's image and likeness, and God is the trinity of persons in relationship, there exists in the human heart a longing for the other. Man, by his very nature, whether male or female, is, in that sense, incomplete. It is now for God to awaken that realization in man's subjectivity, that is, in his psychological experience. So God brings before the man every living creature for man to name. Here is the exercise of man's intellect, because to name in this context means to have knowledge of the essence of the thing and take authority over it. With the preternatural gift of infused wisdom, man can accurately catalogue each of the animals without error. In this exercise, man comes to discover that, quote, there was no helper fit for him, end of quote. Genesis chapter 2, verse 20. The word helper is used elsewhere in Scripture in reference to God coming to our assistance or people helping people, and therefore does not have an inferior or demeaning sense as slave to master. But the man realizes that no living creature fits that status. First, on the basis of rationality, the lower animals cannot be a suitable helper. Second, on the basis of reproduction, the man observes that all the animals have mates except himself. Through this naming, man comes to know himself as dissimilar with all other beings. Thus man's solitude exists on multiple levels, intellectual, psychological, and biological. He alone is a person. But, as Genesis chapter 2 has already hinted at, there is another level relating to man's freedom of self-determination. In chapter 2, verse 16, God gives man freedom to eat of any of the trees of the garden, but is commanded not to eat of the tree of the knowledge of good and evil. Unlike the instinct of animals that determine their actions necessarily, man has freedom of choice, and therefore can enter into a dynamic relationship with God that shapes his character. As well, Part of this freedom and solitude for man involves a new idea of death. Quote, for on the day you eat of it, you shall die. End of quote. As the Theology of the Body, audience 6, paragraph 2 states, quote, Man discovers himself as a subject of the covenant, that is, a subject constituted as a partner of the absolute, inasmuch as he must consciously discern and choose between good and evil, between life and death. In his solitude, man is set into a unique, exclusive, and unrepeatable relationship with God himself. End of quote. On all these levels of uniqueness, man needs and desires the help of another outside himself. Since God does not awaken in us a desire that he will not fulfill, Genesis chapter 2 verses 21 to 23 states that God caused a deep sleep to fall upon the man, and while he slept, took one of his ribs, and closed up its place with flesh, and the rib which the Lord God had taken from the man he made into a woman, and brought her to the man. Thus, original solitude leads to original unity and the nuptial meaning of the body. The deep sleep that falls upon the man recalls Genesis chapter 15, where God strengthens his promise to Abraham with a covenant oath by placing him in a deep sleep and passing through the cut animals. This covenant ratification ceremony involved a conditional self-curse on God if Israel failed to maintain the covenant. In other words, God's love for his spouse, Israel, is sacrificial, and with Jesus Christ to the point of laying down his life, for his beloved. As commentators have noticed, the rib is the bone nearest the heart, signifying complementarity, mutual dignity, and equality. If the bone had been taken from the foot of man, dominance of Adam over Eve could have been implied, and if the bone had been taken from man's head, the reverse could be suggested. This complementarity is affirmed when the man says, quote, this at last is bone of my bone and flesh of my flesh. She shall be called woman, because she was taken out of man. 
Genesis chapter 2, verse 23. Here, for the first time in the book of Genesis, man finds his voice, and it's a cry of joy and recognition. Joy in the sense that the woman is uniquely different from him, but sharing the same nature, and a second person, another I and that this sameness and difference are oriented through a mutual gift to union in love. The fact that God brings the woman to man has been likened to the father of the bride leading the woman to her husband. This leads to verse 24, where we find the biblical institution of marriage, quote, Therefore a man leaves his father and his mother and clings to his wife, and the two become one flesh, end of quote. The essential elements are a man and a woman consenting to form a partnership of mutual support that is indissoluble and open to life. This can be seen in the words help, cling, and be fruitful and multiply. This is where the canonical form 1 entitled Prenuptial Investigation and Inquiry obtains its questions to be put to the couple. Is it your intention to enter into a permanent union which can be dissolved by death alone? Is it your intention to vow exclusive love and fidelity to your spouse? Are you open to the possibility of having children? Only by answering these questions in the affirmative can the couple proceed with their plans for marriage. Becoming one flesh certainly refers to the conjugal union of sexual embrace, but includes, at the deepest level, a communion of persons. As the Catechism states in paragraph 2361, quote, Sexuality, by means of which a man and woman give themselves to one another through the acts which are proper and exclusive to spouses, is not something simply biological, but concerns the innermost being of the human person as such. It is realized in a truly human way only if it is an integral part of the love by which a man and woman commit themselves totally to one another until death. End of quote. It is through this mutual sharing that man discovers who he is. As Gaudi Metzpez states in paragraph 24, quote, It follows then that man can only find himself through a sincere gift of self. End of quote. But marriage also points to a reality even beyond itself. St. Paul in Ephesians chapter 5 states, that marriage is an icon of Christ's union with the church. Christ leaves his father and mother to enter into a marriage with his bride, the church, and so clings to her that they become one flesh. In the incarnation, heaven and earth embrace in the union of divinity and humanity. Then, in a love that is truly mysterious, Christ lays down his life for his bride on the marriage bed of the cross, and in the sacrament of the Eucharist nourishes her with himself until the end of time and the inauguration of the wedding supper of the Lamb in heaven. The domestic church of the family is where this begins, as the parents are the first educators of the faith to their children. Carrying out their baptismal ministry of priest, prophet, and king, parents offer sacrifices, teach the gospel by word and example, and exercise dominion to bring their children to maturity and faith. This is why, as St. Pope John Paul II stated, quote, the church and the world pass through the family, end of quote. Familiaris Consortio, paragraph 79. It is also why marriage and the family are under so severe an attack today from many forces. Which brings us to verse 25, the final verse of chapter 2. Quote, and the man and his wife were both naked and were not ashamed. End of quote. This is the original innocence that our first parents enjoyed in the Garden of Eden, being constituted by grace in a state of holiness and justice, and therefore free from concupiscence, that is, the lust of the flesh, the lust of the eyes, and the pride of life. Since body and soul are in this harmony, there is no danger of objectifying each other, separating body from the person through lust. Rather, the body expresses and reveals the person. The body acts as an intermediary of the subjective interiority of man and woman, and since it is created by God as good, indeed very good, there cannot be shame. Furthermore, 
when man and woman look at each other, they, as the theology of the body indicates, see, as if through the mystery of creation, each other even more fully and distinctly than through the sense of sight itself, that is, through the eyes of the body. Quote, they see and know each other with all the peace of the interior gaze, which creates precisely the fullness of the intimacy of persons. End of quote. Theology of the Body, Audience 13, Paragraph 1. This is why pornography, as St. Pope John Paul II stated, instead of uncovering the body to be consumed in lust, actually obscures the true beauty of the body and the total person. Through objectifying and therefore separating the body from the soul, pornography contributes to the culture of death, since death occurs when the body-soul composite is fractured. In the next podcast, we will examine how this fracture took place with the fall of man and the original sin. 